morning, everybody. How y'all doing? Sweet. Please rise for worship. Welcome, welcome. You may be seated. Good morning, hey, everyone. So glad that you're here. And I'm glad that Catherine's back up here. You're bouncing around like a spring chicken, you know, with your new knee. Yeah. Be careful there. Yeah. <laughs> Don't jump too much. Man, I'm glad you're here. Glad you guys are here. And uh, man, it's awesome, awesome. Yeah. 
Hey, so tell us about uh, tell us about our connect cards. Well, the connect cards are in your seat back, so you can pick one up at the Welcome Center. Come see me. Um, and it's just a great way to give us information so we can get you our email blast every week. Uh, it's a, such a great source of information about what's happening. Uh, and we have so much going on right now. So uh, we just hope you fill these out. And then uh, if you're a new person here, you'll get onto our list. And then Pastor Mitch can reach out to you. And we're just so excited to have you here. Yeah, on, the, on these Connect cards, on this side of the Connect card is a QR code because we're really high tech here. And so you can, if you want to, you can uh, scan that and fill this card out digitally and it'll come to us. And then if you're a regular attender here, or if uh, First Christian Church is your home, then you can actually scan this to, as a way to give too. If you're a guest, we don't expect you to give or participate in that part of the service. We hope that this service is a gift to you. But for everybody else who's a regular attender, we want you to give uh, generously. And so <laughs> and so we're, we're, glad, we're glad for that. Speaking about, speaking about new guests and new members we have. Yes, we have our new member luncheon uh, right after this service. So um, if this is your first time here, you're welcome. Or if you've been coming a little while, we just want to have you there. Uh, you'll get to meet uh, the elders and each other. It's just a really nice way to get to know each other. So we hope to see you there after this service. Yeah, it's, there, there, there's no, you don't have to, like, this is like a member interest lunch. So if, if you just kind of think, I wonder what, wonder what this church is all about. You know, this is a good space for that. To come, we meet around the round tables in the cafe. You can ask me questions. I'll ask you questions and stuff, where you're from and that kind of stuff. It's just a great way to get to meet each other, and we're kind of around uh, round, round tables. And so, uh, speaking of round tables, yes. I am really excited about our Worship Wednesdays. Wednesday. We launched it this past Wednesday. We had about 32 people, I think, for the first week. The idea is, and, and if, you're, if, you're, if you're a guest, and, or even if you've been here for a little while, one thing I've noticed, it's sometimes just hard. It is hard to get to know people and to get plugged in in a church. We come, we sit in rows, and, and we leave, and we get to talk a little bit, but it's just hard to get to know folks. Well, on this Worship Wednesdays, leave that slide up. On this Worship Wednesdays, we're meeting around round tables. And as we meet around the round tables, it, we're, we, we eat food. But it's not about food. We have a worship time, but it's not about the worship time. It's really about the message that God has, and then we discuss that around the table with each other. If you're an introvert, you don't have to talk. If you're an extrovert, you don't have to talk too much, you know? So <laughs> it is really a fantastic. It was our first week doing it, and I will tell you that we have a dynamic duo who is yes. teaching. Dynamic duo yes. who's teaching. Paul, Paul Tucker. Tucker who you're going to hear in just a minute, he's going to lead us through our communion time today. And I asked him to do that because I wanted you to, I wanted you to get to know him here. He's a fantastic communicator. Paul Vachon, he teaches our Saturday morning men's group. He's also fantastic. I am honored and privileged to sit underneath of their teaching on Wednesdays. And then I'll be leading worship on some of the weeks too. I'm leading this Wednesday. So I want to invite you to come out Wednesday. For those of you who your schedule allows, come out Wednesday at 9 a.m. And then we have something else that we need our entire church body involved with. Yes, we are going, we've done this in the past, but we're going to do, try and do a trunk or treat on Halloween. So it's a fun time. People bring their cars, decorate their cars, uh, bring lots of candy, and it's a great community event. So if you're interested in participating or just finding out some more information, after the September 26th service, 1030 service, we'll be having a planning meeting for that. Right. And just to sweeten this deal up a little bit, I, I just made this up last service, all right? Now, we're going to have a competition for whoever decorates their trunk for the kids in, in the most elaborate, you know, the best decoration event. And, I, and we'll get you a gift certificate, a $100 gift certificate for the winner for that, for Finn's Restaurant or something like that, okay? So, and... Uh, uh, and and, and I'll, I'll get Keith Gersio to pay for that or something, you know. So <laughs> we'll, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but, but it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun, and we're, we'll, have, we'll have a good time with that. It'll be a great opportunity to get a bunch of kids and, and stuff onto our, yes, our and property. Yes, we're also looking for candy. So oh, yeah, 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 candy, yeah. I almost so. forgot that. Yes, that's Lots and lots of candy. So if you're at the grocery store this week, pick up an extra bag and bring one to the church and one for me. Yes. Okay. Take advantage of those bogos. Yeah. One hey, let's stand together. And uh, why don't you pray for us, Catherine? Yes. Um, yes, Lord, this was a difficult uh, weekend. Uh, we remember some difficult events that occurred 20 years ago now. This is amazing. 
Um, we just pray for all of those families that were affected and our hearts go out to them. Uh, we're just so happy to be here with you, Lord, in your house, uh, sharing fellowship and just worshiping you all together. So in your name, amen. 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 <laughs>
first happened. The minutes felt like hours. The hours felt like days. And the horror of what happened, one detail after another, could hardly be processed, much less understood. Then days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into years. Memorials were built. Wars were fought. Victims' names were read. Survivors tried to pick up the pieces over and over again. But no matter how much time has passed, we vow to hold these memories. We will never forget those who were taken from us. The world changes and shifts this way and that. But one thing stays constant. One thing is steady. God God weeps with us. God mourns with us. God bottles up our tears and records them in his book. He is closer to you than your own breath and remains the cornerstone of life. God is the solid ground holding us up as the world moves beneath us. It's as true today as it was on that day. Our God reigns. He reigns over principalities and powers. His dominion stretches beyond what our eyes can see. And when the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, our God reigns. And we will always remember. Good morning, church. Thank you for being here today. This is the time now we come together to do communion. This morning we're remembering 9-11, the terrible events of the day, those who lost their lives, remembering the first responders, honoring them, those who run toward danger and not from it, those who have dedicated their lives to help those in need. We are grateful for their willingness to place themselves in harm's way for the sake of others. And we need to remember and respect who they are and what they do. But now this morning, this morning we want to focus our attention on the one who made the greatest sacrifice of all. Jesus Christ our Lord, and our Savior. 
For he, who is the creator of all, died for his creation that you and I may have life. One thing, one thing I think is very important for us to remember as we do this memorial, that this time of remembrance not become commonplace, rote, or that we do it without thinking or putting in real thought. We need to keep our hearts and our minds in tune with what Christ is asking us to do as we do this. May we never take this time lightly we are remembering the Lord's death until he comes. May we never, may we never forget the price he paid for our salvation. And may we always be thankful for the one who gave us his all and became the payment for our sin that we might have eternal life. Jesus Christ our Lord. So if you'll get the elements ready, I invite you to participate. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I'm going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. And Paul says in verse 23, For I pass on to you what I receive from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread. And gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it. And said, this is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And I'd like us to, as we take the bread, just to bow our heads for just a few moments and remember our Lord Jesus Christ during this time. And in the same way, he took the cup of wine And after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink. Let's drink together. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we can't even begin to imagine the cost, the sacrifice. Father, you bankrupt heaven that we might have life. Thank you so much for our salvation made possible through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that as we go through this day and every day, that we will continually remind ourselves of the great gift we have and that we enjoy. And may we be willing to share that knowledge with those we come in contact with. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much.
This program is about solved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the event. What you are about to see is a broadcast of the good news. Tonight on Mysteries Solved. The story of Jesus as chronicled and corroborated by the four books of the gospel. As a young teen, Mark is present for many of the gatherings of Jesus and his followers. His mother, Mary, provides the meeting place right in their very own home. Later, Mark will travel with the Apostle Peter to help spread the resurrection message. He records Peter's memories of Jesus and his ministry. Several years later, former tax collector, Apostle Matthew, writes his memories of Jesus. Through his connections to political circles, he learns of a conspiracy to buy the silence of the guards who witnessed angels rolling back the stone from the tomb of Jesus. He blows the whistle by adding it to his written account of history. Many miles away, a physician named Luke leaves behind a lucrative career to travel with the Apostle Paul. He interviews countless people who knew Jesus and were eyewitnesses to his miracles and resurrection in first hand. It's believed he even spoke directly to Mary about the birth, life, and death of Jesus. He builds a gospel based on these narratives. Finally, after reading the writings of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Apostle John shares his experiences as the best friend of Jesus, deliberately writing about the divine nature of the Savior and things that only the best friend of Jesus could know. Four separate writings written by four different people, all with common elements. At the heart of each, a historically accurate picture of the life of Jesus. In this series, we'll explore those Gospels and recreate history. We'll hear the testimony of those who knew Jesus and were part of his ministry as he walked the earth. Join me as we reveal the truth. Funny story about that video. Uh, did you guys ever ever inadvertently send the wrong text to the wrong person? Um, yeah. So so I was in a conversation uh, the last week before we shot this video. I was in multiple conversations as as my life goes with text messaging. It's like I'm always on the phone texting with multiple people. I had a conversation going on with Michelle. I had one going on with Cliff. Randy. Cliff's in our tech booth. He's the one that created this video. So give him a hand for that. You know. And then I'm texting Jim Spatz about playing pickleball or something. He's one of our leaders in the church, you know, and I was texting him. And I thought I was sending this text to Cliff, but I sent it to Jim. And it, and it says this, just to confirm, I'll meet you in the back alley downtown Venice after dark by the dumpster. Don't forget the trench coat. We're going to have so much fun. I got a response back with just a question mark or something. I don't know. Sure. Man, that was a blast. That was a blast. He's probably going, what in the world is our pastor doing? You know? Well, welcome to our new series, uh, Investigating Jesus. I was meeting with, uh, I've told you about this guy before, Jerry Reader's his name. He's a fantastic friend of mine. He's my, my, one of my mentors. He's about 83 years old, former pastor. He's flown uh, he flew missionary supplies in remote jungles all around the world. He's not survived one, not two, but three plane crashes in his life. He's the most godly man I've ever met, and uh, I love this man. I hope that someday he gets to come down here and that you get to meet him. He's just, he's just phenomenal. And uh, we were talking one day over breakfast, and, and we were just talking about all the cultural changes that we have, uh, cultural things that's going on in America, and all the things. They're just frustrating things, you know. We were talking about the racial tensions and all this kind of stuff, and he just kind of paused, and he said, you know, here's the thing. We don't have a race problem in America. I go, we don't? Sure seems like we do. He goes, no, we don't have a race problem. He goes, we, we don't have, like, gender crisis issues. That's not the problem we have. We don't? It sure seems like we do. We, we don't have, you know, depression problems, and we don't have anxiety problems. We don't have violence problems. 
well, what do we have, Jerry? He goes, what we have is a gospel problem. And, and I thought, man, that is so powerful. It's so rich. And he says, if we can get this gospel piece down, if we can get the good news piece of Jesus Christ down, if we can bring Jesus into the hearts of people, then and only then will our culture begin to change. Everything else that we're doing is just putting Band-Aids on gash wounds. You know, and he, and, he, and, he, and he says what we need is to help people fall deeply in love and be rooted in Jesus Christ. And then and only then will our culture begin to change. And I thought that is very, very powerful. It's a powerful statement. And it's my mission. It's what I want to do. You know, people say all the time to me, so how come you don't talk about politics or that? That's not my mission. It's not my thing, you know. And as soon as I talk about politics, I've just divided half the room, you know. So I'm just like, I'm not doing that. My mission is not that. My mission is to introduce people, help people understand and love Jesus Christ. And when they do, and when you do, uh, that's when culture really begins to change. And everything else that we just treat as a symptom over here, this is the real problem is that we have a gospel problem. And so that's why I want to dive into, I have loved doing these series, you know, Be Healthy series. We did Stay Positive and all those series. But really, honestly, and, I, and we'll, we'll still do those types of series, but, but honestly, those are just kind of treating the symptoms of a greater root problem. The greater root problem is, is that we have a gospel problem, that we need to really deeply know who Jesus is. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to dive in. It's a little longer series. You know, they, the church experts say you should do four-week series, you know. Don't go too many weeks over that. We're going to do about a 10-week series here because we're going to dive in to the book of Luke. And we're going to study Jesus' life. But even that is just going to scratch the surface. I mean, it literally is just going to scratch the surface. I could speak to you for 45 minutes to an hour every single week for three years and still just barely get through the book of Luke. So it's a long, long book. I'm going to give you a challenge at the end of the uh, message today on what we can do. But today is sort of just a, a 50,000 foot view of what we're going to talk about for the series. So, so view this message as a setup. I know we, it looks like we have a lot of uh, a new guests here, but view this message as more of a setup message to prepare the way for the next eight, nine weeks that we have uh, leading up to Thanksgiving, okay? So uh, those of you who don't know, my first name is Thomas. Uh, it's Thomas Mitchell. I go by Mitch for short for Mitchell. I think it's a Kentucky thing, you know. I don't know why people name their kids and, and then call them by their middle name, but it's a, it's a tragic thing. Uh, you know, it's just a, it's a mess when it comes to all this legal stuff and everything. So that's why, I, even on Facebook, I just put Thomas Mitchell Todd. So, and also because, you know, they say don't trust people with two first names, right? So I have three first names and three last names. So what you do with that, I have no clue. But the Thomas portion of my name fits me to a T. It fits me well because by nature, I am a doubter. By nature, I am a skeptic. And, and so uh, I had to come to this point in my life where I went through a crisis of faith, a faith crisis, that I, I, I had to come to this point where I'm believing in, in the Bible and I'm believing in Jesus because I'm believing in it not riding on the coattails of my grandparents' faith or my parents' faith. Now, I don't know how many of you grew up in the church like me, but I grew up from, I never remember a time not knowing Jesus. I mean, I grew up in the church, you know, and sometimes that's a challenge to keep your fire lit, you know, for those of you who grew up in the church. But you have to kind of come to this point of crisis of your faith, I think, so that you realize that this faith is your own faith too. It's not just the riding on the coattails of your grandparents' faith or your parents' faith. Now, some of you didn't grow up that way at all, but for those of you who can identify with me, I went through this period of time, even as I was in school and training to become a pastor, I was going through some really deep faith questions in my life. And so I needed to come to this point where I developed my own faith. And so I, I sort of went an intellectual route on this, not that I'm a great intellectual person, but I, I, wanted to, I wanted to see if I could get where my heart feels like this is right, and I wanted to bridge it with my head, and I wanted to get my knowledge part and the truth right with my heart and have these two meet in the middle so I could really for certain believe that everything that my parents had taught me and everything that my grandparents had taught me was actually real. And so in my early, late teens, early 20s, I began a quest on, on trying to figure out, is this really real? Do I really truly believe this? Or is this some cultural phenomenon that's going on around our world? Was this one of the greatest hoaxes in the history of mankind? You know, what is it that I truly believe? And so I began to read 
authors like C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis really formed a lot of my beginning of my faith and was fantastic. He was an atheist guy, uh, agnostic at best, who decided to go on a quest to see if this, what it is that he re- didn't believe in. And so in his quest to figure out what it was that he didn't believe in, he actually became a follower of Jesus Christ and one of the most prolific writers that we've had of our day in the Christian faith. And it's been fantastic. So C.S. Lewis was a, a big foundational person for me. Also, another li- little bit later on was a, a book from the Letters, of, Letters from a Skeptic is a book that I read. It was a fantastic book. A father and son, both of them Ph.D. guys, and the father was an agnostic and the son was a believer. And they had this letter exchange going back and forth where the father would ask the son some of the deepest, hardest questions to ask in the faith. Like, why does bad things happen to, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? How are some of the worst atrocities explained by a loving God, you know? And so he answers these questions. And I read this book and my faith began to shape that I realized that this is, this is real, that this whole life of Jesus is real. And, and so I, and I thought, okay, if, if the Bible's real, if Jesus is real, then it's going to have to radically change the way that I live. Not about right and wrong, but just the way that I love, the way that I give, the way that I serve, the way that I contribute to the world around me, the way that I interact with others, and what the purpose and the mission of my life itself even is. And I think that once we get to that point where we truly believe that, that this is real, this is not some just thing we're doing on Sundays, you know. This is, this is real. This is real life stuff here. This is our purpose for existence. Then it will absolutely change the way that we live. But what I also want to say is that if you're like me, and if your name should be Thomas, and if you're a doubter, I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this so loud and clear. Don't think less of yourself uh, if you're having doubts. Having doubts does not make you a bad Christian. Having doubts actually will drive us in a quest for God's truth. And having doubts will drive us in a quest for God's truth, and it will cause us to have our faith actually increased if we will follow through with this quest of seeking out God's truth for our life. So just know this, having doubts does not make you a bad Christian. So if you're sitting there feeling guilty because you're going, I I, I mean, I'm going through this and I'm, I'm saying I believe this, but there's still some doubts that I have in my mind about this. That's okay. That doesn't mean you're a bad Christian. But let those doubts fuel your search, even through this series and more, of about God's truth. And this truth of, of, of God in our lives. Uh, if you're having, if you've had some doubts of, about God or you just want some extra increased faith, I'm going to give you four books that I read. I'm going to put them up on the screen. And if you want to get a, your phone out, take a picture of these, you can, um, however you want them. The first one, this, this made a radical change in my life and my faith walk. And that is Evidence That Demands a Verdict. This is a book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict from Josh McDowell. Now, this book, you can even kind of see it there. It's like this thick. Now, this book is not for the faint of heart. This book is for those of you who are like engineers, Ph.D. students, you know. I mean, it's a little bit over my head, to be quite honest with you. I'm not not quite there intellectually uh, like some of you engineer guys out there, you know. I'm not quite there yet. Um, I don't think that way. My brain doesn't think that way. Um, But but it is a fantastic book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. They wrote more of a condensed version of that for people like me. It's only about this thick, and it has pictures. And it's it's called More Than a Carpenter. It's actually a very powerful book. It's a book that's been around for years and years and years. Uh, I think over 10 million, I think, in print. and And this book is fantastic on the life of Jesus and helping you build a foundation a block of faith for the life of Jesus. It's, it's, a, it's an easy read with, with, with heavy, heavy concepts in there. I will tell you, I have handed this book in my life over 30 years. I have handed this book to two Jewish people who grew up believing in God but didn't grow up believing that Jesus was the Messiah. They just believed that he was a good man and a good teacher, which we can't believe that. You can't believe that Jesus was just a good man, and we'll see that through this series. And you'll see that if you decide to read that book. 
Jesus was either he was Lord of our lives, he was either a lunatic or he was a liar. But he can't say he was just a good man and that he wasn't God. He doesn't leave that option for us. And so we're going to explore that through this series. He was, in fact, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so it, that book will help. And those two Jewish people that I gave that book to, they gave their life to Christ. Absolutely amazing. So I, I'm a huge supporter of that book. There's another book. Oh, by the way, Josh McDowell was an atheist as well. And he was in, in search of understanding what it was that he didn't believe in. And so he became a Christ follower and, again, has brought hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people to Christ uh, because of his work that he did in investigating Jesus. Another person who's also an atheist, uh, agnostic, was Lee Strobel. And Lee Strobel, I think they even made a book out, I made a movie out of this, uh, The Case for Christ. Lee Strobel. Another fantastic book. So if you're struggling with your faith, you want a stronger faith in that believe that Jesus is who Jesus said he was, was, this is a fantastic book, Lee, Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ. And then this other one, uh, Dr. Snow over here gave me his, this, uh, this book this week called uh, Cold Case Christianity by Jay Wallace. I haven't read this one yet, but I thought I'd throw it up there anyway for you uh, so that if you wanted to read this, uh, you'd just be on a journey along with me because I haven't read it yet. But he's taken a different approach that I just thought was fantastic, that he is a cold case homicide detective, and he decided to approach the investigation of Jesus like he would a cold case homicide detective investigator and so i thought that'd be perfect for this series i want to read that and see see what that book is all about all right but beyond that one those books have all helped me realize that the bible is absolutely true that god is real and if jesus is the real if jesus is real and the bible says that we have to put our faith in jesus christ as the only way to salvation then it should absolutely change our lives and it will absolutely change our church, and it will absolutely change our culture as we begin to let that penetrate our hearts, penetrate our soul, and we go out into this world that is broken and confused. It will literally change us. But I say all those books, we're primarily going to use the Bible as our source through this series. But the reason that I mention these other books, because if you don't believe that the Bible is really God's word to begin with, then any time I say, well, the Bible says this, you're going to go, well, I don't, that doesn't have any weight to me because I don't really believe in the Bible. So if you don't really believe in the Bible, I wanted to give you some things to help you understand that the Bible really truly is God's word. So that when we say the Bible says, you'll understand that the Bible is actually the inspired word of God to us as his people. And so, but just a quick, quick snapshot and, and I know, I realize this message is like a little bit different for me. I try to do inspiration, education, and motivation within each one of the messages. Uh, this one leans more on the education part of it. But once you get this thing down, we get this kind of in our heads and in our hearts. It, it will help shape and form the way we think about Jesus through this series, okay? Uh, but the Bible, just a little snapshot, the Bible is not actually a book. The Bible is more of a collection of writings in a collection of books uh, that was written uh, and then compiled together, inspired by the Holy Spirit, inspired by God. Did you know that the Bible was actually written in three different languages? It was written primarily in Hebrew in the Old Testament. There's some spatterings of Aramaic in there, and then written in the Greek in the New Testament as well. So there's three different languages. It was written on three different continents, it was written over a span of 1,500 years. I mean, think about that. I mean, how long has our country been a country? What is it, 226 years, something like that? We don't think about the writings. You know, this, this, it took 1,500 years for the Bible to be completed. The Bible was written by over 40 different authors. And over this 1,500 years, you can say, what makes up the Bible? Well, that is something called the canon. And it was when John, when the last eyewitness of Jesus passed away, his last writing was sealed. And it was like sealed and signed. This now becomes the word of God. There's no more other, there's no writings uh, beyond that. It was a sealed collection of the books of God's greatest love story between creator and the created. And the Bible is absolutely amazing. And what's amazing is... When you, when you begin to read the Bible and you, you look at Genesis all the way through Revelation, you see that it matches together 
like a well-formed glove. It is so amazing how it all meshes together. Through every single book in the Old Testament, Jesus is mentioned in one form or another. And so the Old Testament is all about in preparation, about the fall of man. It's all about God's story, history for man. And then it becomes about the Messiah in the New Testament. And about Jesus' life, about Jesus' birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. And then in that, that's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We'll talk about that. And then in Acts, in Acts is the history of the church and how the church began in the first century. And then, the, and then the epistles, the, all that is about is about how do we live this message out? You know, how do we live this gospel message out? And then you have revelations of what, of what the end times are going to look like. And so we're going to talk about specifically, though, we're going to talk specifically about um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then even more specific than that is John. Now, the tra- I mean, uh, Luke. Now, the translation that I use, how many of you guys grew up using the King James Version? Okay, I'm not using that version. So, uh, the, the, the King James Version is a translation. Now, I grew up in Kentucky. I try to work that into every single message. Uh, but I grew up in Kentucky in, like, in a very traditional um, church. And we had old farmers that would have a bumper sticker on their truck. And it said, you know, if it ain't King James, it ain't Bible. You know, I mean, it was like, it was like there were people that thought, you know, there's no other translation but the King James Version. But the King James was a translation into English language in the 1600s. It was written in 1611. So 1,600 years after all these things transpired, did they transition that or translate that into the English language. And there were a lot of things that were in the English language that have changed since then. And so it's not that the King James is a bad translation. It's just that it's hard to understand because we don't use those words and we don't speak that way anymore. But there have been hundreds of translations over the years. I believe that the Bible is inerrant. There is not a single mistake in the Bible in in its original written form. I believe that there are mistakes in the Bible through translation. And we know that. We can see that even from translation mistakes. But in its original form, the Bible has no mistakes. It was written inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. The, The two versions that I use the most, there are some great English translations out there. But the two versions I use the most are the NIV, the New International Version, and I use the New Living Translation. Not the New Living Bible, that's different. I know there's so many different ones out there to keep them straight. But the New Living Translation, the NLT and the NIV, those are the two translations that I use the most. The New Living Translation is one of the most accurate translation of word-to-word translation, and it's easy to read. Okay, so I would highly recommend that you add that to your Bible reading to read the New Living Translation in addition to what you're you're reading. Okay, I think I've laid most of those things out. Um, What I want to talk about is the four Gospels, the the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, there were other writings. There were lots of other writings about Jesus beyond even Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There were other Roman historians. There were Jewish historians that wrote about Jesus. Jesus, but the four that we're going to use and the four that the reason that they were put into the Bible is because they are based on either firsthand information or eyewitness testimony. So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the New Testament opens up with these four different accounts. Now, when you read these four accounts, sometimes people will say to me, they'll say, how come the the stories seem the same, but they're a little bit different? Yeah, that's because imagine if there was a car wreck and you were sitting in one intersection, and another person was sitting in another section and saw this car wreck, if you're going to go give the report to the police officer, your report's going to say something a little bit different than the person across the other side of the intersection. So it's the way they saw of the things that were happening that the story changes a little bit. But at the end of the day, what you saw was a car get mashed up, right? So at the end of the day, what they see and how they bring about the story of Jesus is the same between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's fantastic. It fits together like a glove. But here are the four writers. Let me give you a little bit of background on the four writers. Hang with me. I know this is like history stuff, right? But hang with me. Uh, So Matthew was one of the most unlikely people to actually be included in writings on the account of Jesus. He was a tax collector. Now, tax collectors were the worst of the worst sinners. They even had their own designation for sin. was tax collectors and other notorious sinners, the Bible says. 
Don't think IRS. You might be thinking IRS right now, especially if you had bad, you know, had to pay a lot this past year for taxes or something. But don't think IRS. Our IRS people, they might be confused a little bit, but they're not necessarily evil people, you know. And so, but tax collectors during this day, it was, they were outcasts. They were deep sinners. And here's why. The Jews were underneath the authority of the Romans. And so Romans would collect taxes from the Jews, money which the Jews didn't have very much of, but they would collect money from the Jews. But the Romans wouldn't send their own Roman soldiers in to collect money for the Jews. They would use Jews to collect money from the Jews for their taxes. So they recruited Matthew, and Matthew was a Jewish tax collector. So he would go, and here's the way it would work. Rome didn't care what the Jewish tax collector charged as long as Rome got their money. So let's say the tax impact was 10%. You know, Matthew could upcharge this thing to 13%. Meanwhile, he's living high on the hog, and these other Jews are, you know, struggling to survive. They feel like they've been raped financially by their own Jewish brother. And so they would just be, he was an outcast to the Jews. He was an outcast to the Romans, too, because they didn't want to have anything to do with the Jew. And so here's Matthew, who is this isolated, outcast person who finds Jesus meets Jesus and his whole life is radically changed and he becomes a disciple of Jesus and he travels with Jesus and he teaches and, and, and he, becomes, he becomes a student of Jesus and then he writes all about it from his first-hand experience. Now, the reason I mention all that and the reason it's important is because if there's ever been anybody that thinks, well, maybe this whole thing was just a made-up hoax. Maybe some monk in the year 200 A.D. just got together and said, I'm just going to write a whole bunch of stuff about Jesus, and we'll, write, we'll start this first book with Matthew, and they just start writing all these, this made-up stuff about Matthew. Well, let me tell you, if it was a hoax, they wouldn't have started with Matthew. They wouldn't have even used Matthew's account, because if it was a hoax, they would want you to try to believe something more believable than a tax collector to become the, one of the most influential people in the history of the New Testament, and that is Matthew. So Matthew was a real person, lived in real times, real history, writing about a real God in the flesh, Jesus. That was Matthew. Mark, <coughs> excuse me, Mark was, uh, was he was more of, he, did, he didn't hang out with Jesus. He didn't, wasn't a disciple of Jesus, um, not on the scene. But he was a protege, or he was a student of Peter. Of course, you know, Peter was one of t- Jesus' top three. There was always Peter, James, and John, right? Peter, was, Peter got to see things and experience that not even all the other disciples got to experience. So Peter influenced his protege or Star Wars fans here, his Padawan. Anybody, anybody nerdy enough to know that? What that means? Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. You got to know that. You're not a Star Wars person? So, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So he was, his, he was his protege. So he would take everything that Peter would write about on these events, and Mark would write this down, and it became history of Jesus' life. I'm going to skip Luke for a second and go to John. Now, John's writing is a little bit different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke has about 60% of the same content. John is about 90% of his content is unique. And the reason it's unique is because John writes from the perspective of Jesus' best friend. So as John's writing from the perspective of Jesus' best friend, he's talking more about, he's talking less about events, and he's talking more about the heart of Jesus, and who Jesus was as both man and God. And John's gospel is fantastic. It is a, it is a deep, rich, rich account of the life of Jesus. Um, and so I encourage you, man, I encourage you to read the book of John along with Luke, um, even as we go into this. Now, Luke, Luke is different than all the other writers. Luke is the only one out of the four that is not a Jew. He is a Gentile. So like most of us in this room, he is identifying and writing more to the Gentiles. Matthew's writing to the Jews. You know, Mark's writing to the Jews. John's writing to the Jews. But Luke is actually writing for the Gentiles. And so Luke is extremely educated. He is a very super intelligent guy. At that time, the, the universities and the scholars that he was under, only about 10% of the population had the kind of intellect that Luke had. He was a medical doctor, and he was a historian. So he was a very, very well-educated guy. We know that also from the, his use of the Greek language. He had impeccable uh, use of the Greek language. 
uh, and he writes in very detailed, he's, it's the longest of the Gospels, he writes in very detailed order of these accounts. He was meticulous, he was detail-oriented, and he would go and he would interview these people who were eyewitnesses and he would get the account. He traveled with the Apostle Paul. He spent a lot of time with the Apostle Paul. Some people think that he was Paul's medical uh, physician that traveled with him to keep him healthy uh, during his trouble. We don't really know that. But he was with Paul when he was imprisoned in Rome. Um, and I was there. Well, not at the time. <laughs> I got to see this thing firsthand. Several years ago, uh, we, took, we took our daughter to Rome. Uh, we, went, we were in northern Italy for a couple weeks and to see our son, visit our son who's in the, serving in the Air Force there. And somebody from our church, bless their hearts, they paid for our family to go to Italy. And it was so awesome. And we got over there and had another family in the church uh, pay for us to go to Rome and, and, and do a history tour. It was just so amazing. And I got to Rome. I'm with my daughter. She's about 20, 21 at the time. And it was so fantastic. And I was like on information overload, you know. I'm like, oh, my goodness, over here, this is where Nero was. Nero was persecuting the Christians. And they were in here. The, the gladiators were over here. Over here is where this is the prison. Apostle Paul came in. They put him in this prison. We're standing right here where the Apostle Paul was. He was probably writing in Philippians. He was writing about this. I'm telling my daughter all this. And Luke was there. And Luke's probably writing about the history of the church and listening to stories about Jesus and writing all this down. Are you getting this? Are you getting this, honey? And she goes, Dad, cool your jets. I'm not here for the history lesson. I'm just here for the gelato, you know. So I... Piped down a little bit. She stole my thunder. I'm walking along, and I was being all quiet and, you know, sulking a little bit then. And I think she realized and she recognized, you know, that she shut me down a little bit. So she was trying to be helpful and restart the conversation a little bit. So she sees this statue over to the left. She goes, hey, Dad, we're in Rome, Italy. She goes, hey, Dad, is that Abraham Lincoln? <laughs> no ice cream for you. Now, over here is King Agrippa. King Agrippa met with, you know, so I was going through all this. Man, it was like so fantastic. But here's what I say about it. The reason is because when we read this, you know, this is not made up fictional names, fictional places. This is real life places and real life geography, real life time, real life events that happen. The people and the places and the things, they were all real. You know, like you look at the Book of Mormon, it's not real. I mean, it's just not. I'm sorry. If you grew up in that church, it's just not. You do, it doesn't match up with the evidence of archaeology. Not at all. But the Bible matches up archaeologically amazingly. And it wasn't even just the people that were written. You know, it wasn't just the people that wrote inside the Bible. It was the people peripherally outside the Bible. Other Jewish historians, other Roman historians like Tacitus, Josephus. These were people that had nothing to gain. There was no conspiracy. But they wrote about Jesus. And they wrote about his life. In fact, Josephus wrote this about Jesus. It might be on the screen up there. It said, about this time, there lived Jesus. Now, this is a man not in the Bible, a great known historian. About this time, there lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed one ought to call him a man. For he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was the Christ, Josephus. an amazing and so what we're doing is we're beginning this study on the life of Jesus, and we're using all of these resources, and we're using all of these narratives um, to help us understand and come to this point of faith in believing in Jesus. But we're primarily going to use Dr. Luke. We're going to primarily use Dr. Luke. And like I said, if I was to preach through this, uh, it would take, you know, about, about three years for us to get through that. And I don't think we're quite ready to, to go on that kind of a challenge yet. Um, so, so what I want to challenge you to do is I want to challenge you to read through the book of Luke. Now, if you, if just an average reader, if you were to start reading by yourself silently through the book of Luke, it would take you about two hours um, from, to read the book of Luke. And so it, even if, so if you read the book of Luke, you want to carve two hours out. I can't read for two hours straight. That, uh, my brain doesn't do it. But if you read 15, 20 minutes a day this week, you'll complete the entire book of Luke before I stand up here next week to speak again. And we're going to talk about the birth of Christ next week. 
And, and then we'll end up with the resurrection of Jesus at the end of this, okay? So, but I would really encourage you, read through the book of Luke this week. But here's the four verses that I'm going to start and close with today. This is in Luke chapter 1, the first four verses. And this is giving credence here to Luke, the author. Luke says, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. So, so basically what he's saying is there's been other people. Matthew could have been included in that. Matthew was written before Luke. Uh, Mark could have been included. Math, Mark was written before Luke. Uh, John, he probably wasn't even talking about John because John was written after Luke. And so he's saying there's been many people. He could have been talking about Tacitus, been talking about Josephus. Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have fulfilled among us. So these events, these events happened, you know. They used the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. And so everything that happened up to this point, up before Luke's writing and Matthew and Mark's writing, John's writing, up before this point, everything was done by oral tradition. So they're teaching based on the eyewitnesses. They're teaching based on what they'd seen, based on what they had heard, and they're sharing this out. And Luke's saying, so everything that we've used, everything that we've used in, in the writings here, everything we've used in this whole faith journey in, in building the early church and all that has been done by eyewitness reports first hand reports he says and that's been circulating among the early disciples so Luke says having carefully investigated and again think about his intellect think about his job think about what you would have to the kind of research you have to go through in order to be a medical doctor having carefully investigated everything from the beginning I also have decided to write an accurate account for you, most excellent or honorable Theophilus, so that you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. And so what we see here is that Theophilus, when he uses the word most excellent, most honorable Theophilus, Theophilus was some high up official in the Roman government. He wouldn't have used that term most excellent or most honorable, but he uses this term so that tells us that Theophilus was some sort of a higher up Roman official, possibly a governor of a region. We don't really know that for sure. But he's writing this. He's saying, I'm writing this so you can be certain of the truth of this decision that you've already made. So Theophilus has already become a Christian. He's become a Christian based on oral testimony. And Luke is saying, I'm writing this so you can be certain. Apparently, Theophilus was having some doubts. Apparently, he was having some doubts. And if he was a Roman official, then everything was on the line for Theophilus. If they found out that their Roman official had given his life over to Christ, it could have been uh, very painfully difficult for Theophilus. So Theophilus is having a few doubts, and he even funds and pays for Luke to go on this journey to leave Luke's lucrative career and to go on this journey to explore and to investigate Christianity, to make sure that everything that Theophilus has heard as a young Christian is true. And so that's exactly what Luke does. He goes and he explores and he investigates the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ so that Theophilus, lover of God is what Theophilus means to, so the lover of God can know for certain that this is true. But Paul's also writing this to you and to me so that we can be certain of this truth that we read about in the Bible. All right, that was a lot of history stuff today, wasn't it? I hope you were able to hang with me. If, you know, if you're asleep, just nudge the person next to him or something. But hopefully I tried to keep your attention. But that's the journey we're going to be on. And I'm going to ask you to stand and then we'll pray. And I encourage you to... Uh, we're going to put some more chairs out here next week so we spread out even more and, and invite you to uh, invite your neighbors and friends uh, to come and join with us on this journey. It'll be fun. You won't want to miss next week, just saying. But anyway, let's pray. Father, thank you for your, your word and how it comes alive. And thank you for the ways that we can look at your word and be certain that this faith that we have is not just an empty faith, it's not just a blind faith, but that this is a faith that can be trusted because of the word that you've given us. So I pray 
that you would increase every one of our faith, no matter where we're at, whether we're a doubter, whether we may be an agnostic right now, uh, or whether we've been a deep-rooted follower all of our lives. I pray that every single one of us will have our faith uh, foundations strengthened through this uh, journey together in investigating Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.
Awesome, awesome, awesome. Hey, don't forget, new members luncheon. If you didn't sign up, that's okay. Come on over, and uh, we'll be there for about 45 minutes or so, and I'll give you a little bit of food, and uh, we'll be on our way. If you would like to have prayer this morning, we'll have our elders prayer team over here to your left, and otherwise, I will see you guys who want to talk more about uh, being a member here at the church back in the lobby on your way out. Have a great week. See you next week.